Hi there. Um, this next video segment is going to be very important, especially with the writing of paper one. Um, it's going to not only dovetail nicely with what Douglas has to say as it relates to slavery, but it's also going to be useful information when it comes to um, supporting some of the things that uh, Douglas has to say. So without further ado, let me get started. Um, we're going to be talking about slavery here. Now, in certain forms and fashions, we, we have been talking about slavery in this class uh, right up until right now, actually. Uh, remember, indentured servitude was not slavery in the Douglas sense, but it was the closest shade to slavery that you could get without actually calling it that. Okay, So cheap, coercive labor had always been a part of empire building. You see it in, in virtually every European model, certainly with the Spanish and definitely with the English too. Things are going to change, especially beginning in the 1640s. Uh, we talked a little bit about this when we were discussing the life and times of John Punch. But after 1640, you're really going to see a different animal when it comes to coercive, um, forced labor in the Americas. To begin, I'd like you to understand that the Atlantic slave trade was very old, and it wasn't necessarily invented by the English uh, nor the American colonists. Uh, both the Dutch and the Spanish had been um, thriving in the transatlantic slave trade for decades before slavery was introduced into the North American colonies. As you recall, slavery had existed in Africa, and it was very different than the kind of slavery that you think of in the context of Frederick Douglass. Um, I'm not going to say a whole lot about that, considering we have already covered it. I just would like you to understand that it was not generational. In other words, you didn't pass that condition on to your next generation. What happens is the expansion of European markets. As there becomes more and more of a demand for American crops like sugar and tobacco, there becomes an American demand for increased labor. And so what you see are European merchants that are taking finished products, uh, metal products, textile products, to Africa, exchanging them for human chattels, slavery, and then they are taking the slaves from Africa to the New World where they are, are working on slave plantations. Now, what I've just described to you is what historians call the uh, 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 South Atlantic system. Now for your notes, all I need you to understand about the South Atlantic system, triangle trade, okay? Finished products went from Europe south to Africa. Slaves uh, were traded for those finished products. Uh, the slaves were then taken to the Americas, and they were the ones that were performing the heavy lifting for the cash crops. And then, of course, the cash crops, like sugar and tobacco, were taken to uh, Europe, where they were turned into manufactured, ready-to-consume products. You've got a triangle trade, okay? Now, the key to the transatlantic system would be the crop of sugar. And I want to spend just a second on sugar because it's one of the earliest cash crops, most important cash crops, and it really drives the transatlantic slave trade early on. Sugar was a terribly important and profitable cash crop, a crop that grew very well in the Americas and sold even better on the European marketplace. Now, if you know anything about sugar production, you know that it's exceptionally labor-intensive. There's a lot of heavy lifting that comes along with that. Um, sugar actually was so profitable, though. In other words, the sugar planters in places like Jamaica and Barbados made so much money on this crop that there were very few breaks, very little food, very poor shelter that was given to the slaves that were producing all of this wealth. In many instances throughout the Caribbean, most of your sugar planters would just work their slaves so hard that they would pass out from exhaustion, die uh, of overwork. Um, sometimes the conditions in which sugar was produced were very, very hazardous and people would have an accident and die that way. But instead of slowing down, taking breaks, and giving adequate levels of food and rest, uh, the planters just made a cost-benefit analysis and said it's much more cost-effective for me to work these people around the clock and, you know, when one, one of them keels over from exhaustion, I'll just pluck somebody else off, off, of the, um, off of the boat. I'll buy somebody new. So what I'd like you to understand very early on is that slavery in the Caribbean, 
first of all, is much older than slavery in the North American context, and it's also much, much more difficult. I'm not saying that there's a good place to be a slave, I'm simply saying that if you had to compare the two, the Caribbean and a place like the Chesapeake, um, the Chesapeake is far less labor in, in intensive and also far less hazardous to one's health. Now, that begs the question, how did slaves get from Africa to the New World? In general, what I'd like you to know about this, this was a process known as the Middle Passage. It was a process in which captured Africans, these are people that were either prisoners of war, people that had been kidnapped, what have you, they were packed onto boats and they were sent across the Atlantic Ocean. And keep in mind, this is the middle of the 16th, 17th century, so we're talking about some really, really um, grotesque living accommodations. Um, it's taking quite a long time, months, to get from point A to point B. I'd also like you to understand that this is a transformation where Africans not only left the old world and headed for the new, their condition of servitude changed, right? When they were in the old world, when they were in Africa, they were captives, right? They were prisoners. When they got to the new world, they became slaves. So it's not just the, the, the actual voyage from point A to point B, although it is that. It's a transformation in terms of condition from captive to slave. As you might imagine, the conditions on the boat ride over there were abysmal, not only because it was uncomfortable, I, I think that you could make a very easy case for that no matter how you went, but these people went as captives, right? Most of the people that were shipping them thought of them as cargo. They were, they were property, and the more property that you could pack on any one ship, the more your profits would be once you reached your final destination. Now, that being the case, most of your African slaves were not only chained together um, below the deck, but there were all kinds of really just grotesque conditions that they suffered from. Uh, disease, dysentery, I mean, think about it. Anything that you're doing for three months, you're, you're doing right there strapped to another human being. So I'll let your imagination do the work there, but just for a second, I want you to, you know, picture something in your mind. And the, the Atlantic Ocean is very rocky. It's a very rough ocean. Um, so that means that you were doing a lot of rocking back and forth, you know, like what I'm doing right now. Um, you're also doing that chained, probably to a, a, um, a fixed place, and it's a situation where you can't really do anything to kind of offset your skin rubbing up against the boat. So where I'm going with this is you, you would bleed, you, you would get cut, you would get scraped, and a lot of times this blood would, uh, you know, would, would run down on the bottom of the hull. This being the case, combined with everything else that everybody else is doing underneath the, um, the deck, you could actually smell a slave ship coming from over one mile away. I mean, imagine that you could smell a slave ship coming. I mean, imagine the kind of conditions if this were the case. Okay, so the Middle Passage, a nightmare of a situation for these captive Africans that are being brought over. Now, we've talked about slavery in the context of the Caribbean. I'd like to move it north to North America now. And the first context of North American slavery I'd like to examine would be slavery in New Amsterdam. Now, those of you that have been following along closely know that New Amsterdam is the capital of the New Netherland, which is the Dutch colonial empire in North America. Now, the really big economic interest in New Amsterdam, that would be the Dutch East India Company. This is the corporation, the state-owned corporation, uh, that is probably most prevalent and most important for the Dutch in the New World. Now, this being the case, the Dutch really need to build some sort of infrastructure in North America. And what that means is they need a lot of hands on deck, a lot of labor. So in addition to things like tea and other things from the East that were being imported into the New World, the other thing that the company brought a lot of was slaves. Now these are what we refer to as company slaves in the sense that they were owned by the company. Um, it's a form of labor that the Dutch are bringing over from the Old World, transplanting it into the New. And the purpose is not necessarily to create agricultural wealth like what you're seeing happen in the Chesapeake. Uh, 
The purpose is to just get that colony off the ground. So these company slaves were a really unique type of slavery in the New World. Now keep in mind, the heart of New Amsterdam's economy was commerce. It was not agriculture. So what that means, everybody, is that there's not a real need for year-round slavery the same way that there was in places like the Caribbean. This being the case, Dutch East Indian slaves had what we call half freedoms. The best way to think of it is half the year they were um, forced to do the heavy lifting, build the buildings, the roads, the bridges, what have you. And then the other half of the year, when they were not needed, they basically you know, got to live free lives. So I'm not saying it was Disney World, but, you know, it was much, much better than having to work on a sugar plantation in Barbados. Now, keep in mind, you, you could be called up at a moment's notice, and so it really wasn't as free as I'm making it out to be, but, again, much, much better than other areas in the Americas. Now, a few other things I'd like to point out. Um, very similar to John Punch, after 1640, uh, the conditions of these half-slaves became increasingly permanent as chattel slavery. Now, one of the examples that we can point to is that after 1640, uh, fewer and fewer African and then African-American children that are born were born free. Most of them are born following the condition of the mother. If your mom's a slave, like Frederick Douglass's mom was, then you'd be a slave. Okay. Now, what you see in the context of Dutch slavery in North America is it begins to expand. New York legalized slavery in 1665 and it was followed very shortly thereafter by the English colony of Massachusetts. So my point in this in the context of North American slavery is that there was once a point, a point in time when there was slavery that was alive and well people profited from it in the North. Okay, We'll see why it dies out a little bit later in the semester. Now, another example of the context of North, excuse me, North American slavery I'd like you to be mindful of would be slavery in the Chesapeake. Now, for those of you that don't know where the Chesapeake is, we've talked about it in this class before. I'm talking about Virginia and Maryland, in particular the eastern chunks of those, um, those states, uh, the Chesapeake Bay in particular. And we know it was tobacco, and in particular the tobacco revolution, that drove the economy in that part of North America. Tobacco was to Virginia and the Chesapeake what sugar was to the Caribbean. It was the cash crop, and therefore life revolved around it. This being the case, it's pretty quick that tobacco planters understand the best way to exploit this particular cash crop is through the plantation setting. Import an enormous amount of slave, uh, excuse me, labor and uh, work it as hard as you can to peak levels of performance as much as part of the year as you can, okay? Now, in the Chesapeake, you've got a much longer growing season than you do New York. So the contract periods of the coerced laborers are considerably longer than what you're seeing with those half-slaves in the North. And again, after 1640, you begin to see more and more tobacco growers in the Chesapeake find sneaky ways, similar to the life and times of John Punch, to increase the longevity, the length, of these contracts. As the tobacco revolution really begins to grip the Chesapeake, you begin to see an increased need for labor, and not only an increased need, but an increased need to shorten, to limit the amount of labor turnover. So in 1662, what you see various colonies like Virginia and to some extent Maryland do is introduce new codes for the legalization of what we call chattel slavery. Chattel just simply means property. So what you're talking about at this point is a different animal than indentured servitude. I mean, indentured servitude was not infinite. It was finite. It had a beginning and it had an end. Chattel slavery means that you're not only a slave for life, any offspring that you give birth to during the course of your life now belongs to your master as well. It's property slavery, the same way that your cow, your horse, is a part of your property as well. After 1662, there are fewer and fewer ways to free oneself in places like Virginia. And not only that, you're also beginning to see what I call the Americanization of the uh, slave population in the Chesapeake. 
Remember how I told you that labor conditions were not nearly as intense in the Chesapeake as they were in the Caribbean? Well, what that meant was more slave babies were able to survive into adulthood. More slaves themselves were able to survive and marry. And when they married, uh, they produced offspring. And as I've just pointed out, through chattel slavery, that offspring belongs to the original owner. So what you're seeing in the Chesapeake, for a lot of different reasons, is a native-born slave population that's forever increasing. Okay, so with each generation you're seeing more slave babies being born and because tobacco was not nearly as profitable as sugar was if you're a tobacco farmer you're a plantation owner you were much more inclined to treat your slaves a little bit better again I'm not apologizing for slavery I just like you to understand that slaves were treated better in Virginia than they were in a place like Jamaica for instance okay so you do see slave growth in the Chesapeake colonies, and this is a native-born African-American slave population. The last context I'd like to discuss the institution of slavery with you is um, the Low Country. Now you're going to know the Low Country as the Carolinas, and in particular South Carolina. In 1629, King Charles II established uh, the colony that we'll know as South Carolina, and uh, what he what he basically did was he incentivized it by you know, picking a collection of strong men that would have very, very absolute control of the colony. And he put them in charge of recruiting a labor force. And the initial thought was that labor force would come from white indentured servants who were trying to get away from the Caribbean, okay, for obvious reasons. Well, over the course of time, they also began to import African indentureds as well. Keep in mind this is before 1640 so most of the people that are coming over from Africa would be considered indentureds and not uh, chattel slaves. But the entire time that they're bringing these people over there they're desperately searching for their cash crop. Tobacco it doesn't really like to grow in South Carolina the low country the same way that it does in the Chesapeake and it's not quite far south, south enough to grow sugar. But Africans had been growing this crop called Aroiza for generations, and they had learned how to grow it way back in the old world in Africa, and then they began cultivating it in the new world. Um, if you think about South Carolina's economy, one of the things that has always been a staple is rice production, which is exactly what Aroiza is. So it was through the slaves that these slave owners, these rich men, learned to cultivate a cash crop, something that would sell very well in the European marketplace. And rice became the basis of South Carolina's economy the same way that tobacco had become the staple of Virginia's economy. Now think about it. Where does rice like to grow? It likes to grow in swampy, watery areas. So if you think about the cultivation of rice and juxtapose it to the cultivation of tobacco, rice cultivation is going to be way more labor intensive. You're going to have to do things like drain swamps, and that's going to mean working in ankle, sometimes thigh deep mud and water. It's going to mean things like you're going to have malaria outbreaks. Diseases are going to be much more likely to hit your uh, workers similar to the che or, excuse me similar to the Caribbean and opposed to the Chesapeake. Um, you're going to have higher fatality rates in South Carolina as opposed to uh, Ches the Chesapeake. So what I'd like you to understand here is whereas the Chesapeake had a naturally growing increasing slave population, it was African American. What you would have in this in the Low Country in South Carolina, especially in the early days is a re-Africanized slave population. It was much similar to the Caribbean in the sense that when people died you just more or less imported new laborers from Africa as opposed to what's happening in the Chesapeake where the next generation just kind of comes along and eventually replaces the outgoing generation. Um, it's also noteworthy that South Carolina was a slave society in the sense that it's the one part of North America where the slave population actually outnumbers the white population and that means that these people lived in virtually constant fear of a slave uprising. More of that in just a minute.
Now, for our purposes, I'd like you to understand that there's beginning to emerge an African-American community in the New World. Okay, there's variations of slave origins, and that's not by accident. That's how slave owners wanted it. You would want people from various parts of the African continent because that means that with slave, they would, in some instances, be enemies. They would not like each other very much. They would speak different languages. They would have different customs. And in short, they would not get along very uh, much like if you had somebody from one particular part of the continent. It all goes back to control, but over the course of time, what you see is the creolization of the slave population. Creolization. Now, we've talked about that word before. It just simply means the blending of cultures, and that's exactly what you're seeing in the African-American world in North America. You have, for instance, families that were destroyed by the institution of slavery, but you would also see the adoption of people that were not blood relatives, people, uh, children of mixed racial heritage. Uh, keep in mind, one of the things that was going on in the Middle Passage, in particular if you were a woman, was the institution that was rape, and so there were a lot of babies that were born of a mixed racial heritage, but because the condition of the child followed that of the mother, they were born a slave. Okay. You also had uh, the emergence of what you could call Black English, okay? African languages and various dialects were not only blended to fit into something that people could understand in terms of an African language, they were adapted, I mean, but you also have the mixture of uh, English. Um, so what you're seeing is this hybrid language that many historians point to, the language of Gula or Gula, um, which was African in its root origin, but it had various English aspects in it. In short, what you're talking about is the emergence of African-American culture in the New World. Next, I'd like to talk about resistance and accommodation. One of the ways that slaves, well, I guess I should start out by saying that slaves resisted in a number of different ways. It's so easy to just assume that they just went along with this uh, and rolled over. They certainly did not. One of the things in places like South Carolina that was very emblematic of the labor regime was something called the task system. You'd be given a task early on in the morning, clear this uh, land, for instance, and once you completed the task, the rest of the day was yours to do whatever you wanted to do with it. So if you wanted to grow a little corn, a little squash on the side, you could do that given the fact that you had already completed your task for the day. There are some people that are able to purchase their freedom from slavery by selling what they're producing on the side and eventually saving it and buying their freedom. Of course, you could always flee to the countryside. You could run away. Now, there were a lot of really interesting and also very graphic ways that slave owners discouraged their slaves from running away. You have all these medieval European punishments that were exaggerated when they got to the New World. Um, for instance, if you ran away once, you were tied to a tree in front of the entire plantation, for, in, uh, for uh, to be sure, and you were whipped severely, um, very severely beaten. If you ran away again, they brought you back, they would not only whip you again, in a lot of instances they would put you in one of these like Hannibal Lecter-like uh, contraptions where it would cover your face and uh, a collar with a big long metal branch hanging out from it which would made it virtually impossible to really get through that brush in the back country. And if you ran away a third time and you were a man, um, they would castrate you. Now understand something, if you're going to do that to somebody, that's 99% chance that they're going to die. So the point is not necessarily to punish that individual, it's to serve as a warning for everybody else that maybe be crunching the numbers when it comes to running away. This is what we do to the people that run away. But in order to do that, you need to be able to afford to be able to sacrifice that slave so, at any rate. Now, there's all kinds of silent protests that we can get into here, but um, just understand that the slave resistance was not one thing, it was always a myriad of various things, and certainly Douglas makes a case for that too. Now, we've talked about the people that are doing the heavy lifting, now I'd like to talk about the people that are making them do the heavy lifting. I need you to understand that nobody came to America unless they were forced to come to America. 
In other words, if you had money and you had political power and you had social prestige, you, you didn't leave London. You had no need to. So the people that are all coming over here, most of those people are coming over here with a chip on their shoulder. They were, they were considering themselves second-class citizens, and the English nobility generally looked down their nose at them. So when they got over here, they tried to mimic, they tried to emulate their English aristocratic cousins across the Atlantic Ocean. They built these lavish mansions, and they dressed themselves in the, uh, in the, in the latest Parisian and Venetian uh, fashions. But the root of what I'll call the Southern gentility was the institution of slavery. This is, if you were white in, the, in, in places like South Carolina and Virginia, this is the way that you distinguished yourself against other white people. Let me give you a, a quick for instance. In the 21st century, it's trendy for white people to have a tan, okay? And uh, that would have been unrecognizable to people in the 1640s and 50s, considering if you had very pasty white skin, that meant that you didn't have to get out in the sun very much because you were so rich that you had other people doing that kind of thing for you. So what I'm getting at here is everybody's chasing this lifestyle of the Southern gentility, and even though you've got an institution like slavery that only on its best day works for maybe, maybe 1% of the population, you know, it's, it's, it's adamantly, staunchly defended by the working class white population who it not only hurts economically, and definitely Douglas makes a case for that, but um, it's pretty clear that there's a lot of commonalities between the slave population and the working class population in terms of both of their lives would be infinitely better if slavery just went away. But nonetheless, this is one of the ways that slave owners were able to sell the institution of slavery to the working class white brethren. Okay? Now, as I've already mentioned, wealth was concentrated at the top, and slavery is an institution that tends to lend itself very well to the concentration of wealth into very, very few hands. Um, you know, I've already mentioned the fact that everybody that you imported in Virginia, you got an additional 50 acres of land. So it's a classic case of the rich getting richer and the poor getting poorer. As you see more and more use of African-American slavery, you see fewer and fewer opportunities for working-class whites, and there are fewer and fewer opportunities to become wealthy. Okay. Now, it's not only that, it's, it's that working-class whites were also forced to enforce this institution of slavery that directly worked against their own economic interests. For instance, if you were a man between the ages of 16 and 47, you were required, it was mandated in places like South Carolina, you serve in slave patrols. You would have these patrols of working class white men that would just roam the countryside and what they would be looking for are black people in places that they were not supposed to be. Um, generally speaking, they were designed to not only keep an eye on the black population, but they're also designed to bring runaway slaves back to their owners. Um, in addition to the slave patrols, you also have what I call Sunday gun days. Um, now, what I mean by that is Sunday is the day of worship, it's day for church, and uh, you were required, if you were white and a man, you were required to bring a gun to church. Now, why bring a gun to church of all places? Think about it. This is a society that's not necessarily a Christian society, but there were a lot of Christians in the society. And Sunday was the one day that the slaves, and the field hands anyway, had the day off. So if there's ever going to be a slave rebellion in a place like South Carolina, it's probably going to come on Sunday, or at least the thought was, considering that was the day that the slaves had off, and that was a day that they could get together and possibly conspire. So if this was the case, then the white community had to be ready to go at a moment's notice, even if they were in the middle of worship at the time. So if you were a white and you were a man, you were required to bring a gun to, um, to, to church and possibly take a bullet for this institution that was eroding your economic and social uh, uh, well-being in the community. Let's talk about one of those, um, those instances of slave insurrection. In 1739, there was an individual named Jemmy, who was an African in South Carolina, that uh, was very good at 
networking with people, shall we say, okay? And in 1739, it's Jemmy that puts together what would later become known as the Stono Rebellion in South Carolina. Now keep in mind, South Carolina was the one part of North America where the slave population actually outnumbered the white population, and this was their ultimate fear. Now it's Jemmy that leads this group of slaves, this band of slaves, there were hundreds of them eventually, and they're in search of liberty. I'll, I'll, I'll get that and just get back to that in just a minute. But what they do is they raid this store, this general store called Hutchinson's, and they're looking for things like guns and ammunition, which they do. Now, even though there are many of these people that are participating in this rebellion, um, they understand that they cannot defeat the state militia, that eventually if they try to go toe-to-toe, -to -toe, they're going to lose. They just do not have the manpower. Eventually, you're going to get other militias from other colonies throughout North America. So their thought is to make it to Florida, which was Spanish territory at the time, and consequently, or not consequently, but um, it was, it was, slavery was outlawed, so that's why they want to make their way to uh, Florida. Now, they come very close, but they also, um, they also fall a little bit short. They encountered the South Carolinian militia, where this Stono Rebellion eventually evaporates. Um, the casualty figures run very, very high. There are 20 whites that are killed in what would be called the Stono Rebellion, and 44 slaves. But the real significance of the Stono Rebellion is what comes afterwards in what was called the Negro Act of 1740. In South Carolina, this law stipulated that blacks could not be out after dark. Um, if they were, they had to be accompanied by a white overseer. Um, they could not own weapons, could not have access to weapons. In short, it really tightened the grip over black quote-unquote liberties in the New World because people had a very keen remembrance memory of the Stone Rebellion. And if you couple that with a state like South Carolina, that or colony rather, like South Carolina that lived in constant fear of slave insurrection, the Stono Rebellion was a powerful reminder as to how and why liberty for slaves in any form or fashion was very dangerous. I'm hopeful that what this segment has done has really kind of connected some dots in terms of what Douglas is talking about, and there's various things that you can use in it to kind of elaborate and support what he says. For instance, how does slavery victimize the slave? Well, it's the dehumanization process and certainly the Middle Passage would qualify as a process that was dehumanizing. How does it victimize the non-slave holding white? Well, one of the ways that it does that is it, um, it, it makes them do some of these, uh, some of these uh, things like serve in the slave patrols or fight in the uh, state mili or colonial militias when, in fact, slavery is actually destroying economic opportunities for whites. Um, I think you could make a similar case for uh, the southern gentility in terms of this obsession with material wealth, especially as it relates to slavery. It turns them into terrible people the same way that Douglas uh, kind of demonstrates in his book. Okay. At any rate, I hope this was helpful, and uh, when we come back, we're going to be talking about the further development of the American colonies.